Aaron, it is called the Locky virus, and cybersecurity experts say it infiltrates your computer via email, gets in there, and holds your files hostage until you pay up. We knew something happened almost, you know, within seconds. Dennis Daryl Morton says it happened after an employee opened an email at his Alpharetta office. Kind of started locking up some Word files, documents, uh, Excel spreadsheets. Morton says a message popped up pay up if you want access to your files. It's paid in something called Bitcoin. A lot of businesses have been hit by this in recent months. Cybersecurity consultant Tony Yusita Velez runs a company called Versprite. He specializes in helping healthcare providers secure their data. Yusita Velez says what targeted Morton is a ransomware called Locky. It's a genre of malware that uh, infects your computer, encrypts all of your files, and uh, forces you to pay a ransom. You see, Velez says cyber criminals gain access to your files, usually through email that appears to be from a familiar source. Validate and make sure that, you know, the email that you're receiving is expected based upon your line of work, the information that you're expecting to receive, you know, just do a simple gut check. Morton says the attack never affected patient records because they're protected on an off-site cloud. He told us he did not pay the ransom, instead paid an IT person to free his files. That's frustrating. And you see the Velez says in addition to checking the source of the emails, he says back up your files and don't operate your computer as an administrator capable of making changes to your computer. That's because he says once the virus gets in there, if you are the administrator, it can change things if you have the privileges to do so. Reporting live in Alpharetta, Mike Pachinik, Channel 2 Action. Offices across the country recovering after a ransomware attack. The IT company that was attacked is based out of West Dallas. Cassidy Williams joins us now from the newsroom with more on what this means for patient data. Your dentist holds a lot of your personal information, name, phone number, address, social security number, and it's unclear if that information could now be in the hands of a hacker. A dentist's most important tool may not be something that goes in your mouth. Most offices rely on a computer to schedule patients and store important patient data. Around 400 offices across the country had to try and operate without a computer this week after a software system was hacked. I reached out to multiple offices impacted in southeast Wisconsin, while none of them were willing to comment. Some did take to Facebook to vent their frustrations. One posting, quote, more and more lost hours in revenue with patients, getting more and more frustrated. Another saying we are having issues seeing patients and keeping our people working. The issues have to do with IT vendor Perksoft. Perksoft is based out of West Dallas and is used to back up client data for digital dental record. Perksoft was a victim of a ransomware attack on Monday morning. That's when an attacker gains access to valuable digital files and locks them away and then demands ransom to release them. Five days after the attack, some offices still don't have access to their files. Perksoft did not return our calls, but has also been actively posting on Facebook. In a post Friday morning, it says they are, quote, making more and more progress on recoveries. The Wisconsin Dental Association advised against dental offices telling patients about the attack, saying it's too early in the investigation. Explaining in a statement, they have not been able to determine whether any practice or patient data was accessed or compromised. 
The WDA statement said it would notify patients once the investigation is complete. It's unclear how long that could take. The WDA says it is working with the FBI's cybercrime unit. Live in the newsroom, Cassidy Williams, Fox 6 News. Well, it's good to get the message out there so people are aware. All right, Cassidy, thank you. Just after the news. Prosperident is a company that was created over 30 years ago, and it exists for one reason, and that's to protect dentists against being stolen from. And there are lots of people who would like to steal from a dentist. Maybe it's a staff member. Sometimes you hate to think about it, but it's another doctor in a group practice, or maybe it's somebody external like a bookkeeper. And we do investigations when people have concerns, and we also have a proactive product called Office Protection System that's designed to help dentists set themselves up so that they're less vulnerable in the future. When we do an investigation, the first thing I always tell people is that it is completely stealthy. In other words, your staff or the person that we're looking at has no idea whatsoever that you decided to take a look at your practice. And that's important regardless of the final outcome. I mean, if somebody is stealing from you, you don't want them to see the axe that's about to land on them. And if there's nothing going on, you don't want to get your staff members or other people you work with stirred up. So it's stealthy. We pull apart your practice management software. We have some people who are real experts at that. And if embezzlement is buried in there somewhere, we will find it. When people call us, they're very upset. We can all understand how somebody who lives and works in a healing profession wants to trust people, wants to see the best in them. When you suddenly believe that you can't trust one of the people who works for you anymore, it's very unsettling. And our job is to help resolve that feeling. If embezzlement is happening, the resolution comes because that person's no longer working. If embezzlement is not happening and there were other reasons why that concern arose with you, we're detectives. Our job is to help you understand what caused the issues that you saw. And in either case, we'll make you feel a lot better after than you did when you called us. Sometimes people are worried that they're going to be judged. They maybe think that they've been inattentive to the running of their practice, that we're going to look down our nose at them and scold them for that. And it's just not what we do. We believe that every dentist is entitled to honesty from their staff, no matter what. And if you call us, you can look forward to a warm, welcoming, supportive environment where we make it clear that we are on your team and that our only job is to help you. Other reason that people don't call us sometimes is they make a really simple mistake. They confuse somebody who knows 20% more than they do with an expert. Maybe it's your accountant. Maybe it's a trainer for your software company. Maybe it's a consultant. And these people all want to help you. It's not, it's not a question of that at all. However, we spend all day, every day, thinking about one problem. And that problem is staff stealing from you. If you have a concern, you need an expert. largest breaches of personal information in our region's history is coming to light now, a little more than a year after workers at a dental practice in Lycoming County learned of the problem. Stolen data includes the social security numbers of at least 5,000 people from the Williamsport area, sensitive information that could be obtained by identity thieves. Action 16 investigative reporter Dave Bowman joins us live from our newsroom with the story. Dave. Scott, the attorney for Lenapin Implant Dental Center in Williamsport claims a computer hacker stole the sensitive information and posted it on an online sharing site last September. Most patients in the stolen database are from Williamsport and surrounding communities. The ones who talked with us say they had dental surgery several years ago, and they say they had no idea personal information, including social security numbers, were stolen from a dental practice in Williamsport and was easy for anyone to get. From a retiree in Montoursville. Is that your social security number? Yeah. To a young husband in Williamsport. I have no idea where you would have got that. To a woman staying at an assisted living center. My knee. You know, I don't know. We were even able to obtain the social security number of the mayor of the city of Williamsport. I was stunned. 
Mayor Gabe Campana thinks he gave his personal information to a Williamsport dentist when he had a wisdom tooth removed about 20 years ago. Somebody that actually hacked a computer or somehow got access to those numbers, they need to be accountable. My personal opinion is an IT guy had to have done this or someone knowledgeable with computers. Justin Schaefer of Dallas, Texas informed us about the breach when he talked with us via Skype. Schaefer calls himself a computer tech worker. And he says he came across the breach while researching a medical office management computer program called Dentrix last year. Dentrix is the most used software of its kind in the U.S. Schaefer says he found a copy of a Dentrix program on an internet file sharing site. Schaefer says he was curious, so he downloaded the program, registered to the Lenap and Implant Dental Center of Williamsport. And to his surprise, Schaefer says it had the names, addresses, and in most cases, the social security numbers of 11,000 people in the Williamsport area. You can just download Dentrix and install it and just use this database and, and surf it like you would the internet. A lawyer for the dental practice and owner David D. Gialorenzo called this an unauthorized hacking incident, adding much of the sanctity of the home is violated in a burglary. This illegal intrusion has caused real and lasting damage, and Dr. D. G. Lorenzo and his patients are the victims. When the practice learned of the breach last fall, it sent out 5,000 letters like this to patients. It warned them of a data security incident. It promised the practice would take additional security measures. But those people we interviewed say they never got a warning. Have you been told of any breach of security by a dentist's office? No. The lawyer for the dentist practice in Williamsport has contacted Pennsylvania State Police and the FBI. But those two law enforcement organizations do not comment on whether or not a criminal investigation is even underway. So the question of who took the sensitive information from the dentist's office and why remains unanswered. Meantime, thousands of social security numbers of people in the Williamsport area remain potentially a couple of mouse clicks away from identity thieves. What do you do about it? I definitely need to get online and check with one of the identity theft sites. A spokeswoman for the company that makes the Dentrix software via email called the breach, quote, isolated and the only one of which we are aware, adding patients visiting dentists with Dentrix software should feel confident of its security. Now, there is no evidence that any of the personal information taken from the Williamsport Dental Office has been used by identity thieves. Patients of the Lenap and Implant Dental Practice in Williamsport are urged to get their credit checked at least once a year. And our website and our link to this story has a link on how you can protect yourself. Dave Bowman, Newswatch 16. Dave, thank you very much. An update to an action. Office protection system is one of the best ways that we can help a dentist protect themselves against embezzlement. And what we do is we start by looking at your systems, identifying the weaknesses that an embezzler could exploit, and then helping you correct them. We look at a lot of areas that might seem unconnected, but they all relate to embezzlement. One of the things that we spend a lot of time on is helping dentists understand their financial reports. So what reports should I look at? What do I do with them? And a lot of dentists say to us, nobody taught me how to do this in school. I don't know how to protect myself. Well, after you work with us, you will know. When people call us to have their practice investigated, they're concerned. The thought that somebody they trust might be taking their money is just hard for anybody to take. And when we do our investigation, at the end, people get relief. And it's relief either because we find embezzlement and they fire somebody, or we don't find embezzlement and they know that they're not being stolen from. What people say to us repeatedly is, you know, I don't want to feel that way again. And office protection system is really the pathway to never have that kind of feeling. What we do is we help you put systems in place that protect you. We teach you how to run them. We make it so that you are comfortable with how your practice runs financially. And when you do that, you're never going to be in that position again of not knowing.
Two computer files held for ransom only on six. A Maitland dentist who was targeted tells us the price to get them back just keeps going up the longer he waits. Investigators say this is a growing trend. Ransomware attacks are crippling small businesses all over Central Florida. So News 6's Eric Von Anken is live in Maitland. Eric, we should be clear here now. Fortunately for this doctor, no patient records are at risk. Right, Matt. They knew, of course, to protect their patient information. They just didn't think anybody would care about their accounting information. Well, their IT team over there in the dentist's office says this is the new con game, that once hackers get into your computer, they search for QuickBooks because once they find it, they know you're a business and they know you probably got money. When you look in the mirror, don't call me, okay? Dr. Carl Balancioni, a Maitland dentist. All right, Marie, let me know if you feel anything, okay? Would not be smiling and joking. I know what I'm doing. I slept at a Holiday Inn. If hackers had gotten to his patient records. You could be out of business. All of his sensitive patient information is securely stored on his system. But his QuickBooks files weren't. He went to log in on his computer, and this is his main computer, and it was locked. He couldn't get in. Dr. Balancioni explains that somebody in his office likely clicked on something they shouldn't have, giving hackers access to the computer and QuickBooks. He lost the last five months of his accounting records. And said, you've been held for ransom. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, they found out that it was a ransom software, and they wanted $10,000 to release the information and he had 48 hours to respond, otherwise it was up for 20,000. We just told you last month how hackers are moving from big businesses to city governments. Riviera Beach in South Florida paid hackers 65 Bitcoin, roughly $600,000 to get their files back. Lake City sent hackers 42 Bitcoin, that's $480,000. Yeah, I, I think it's a business strategy uh, for the people who are, are asking for ransom, the, the cyber terrorists, if you will. Seminole County Sheriff says now small businesses are being targeted nine county wide just this year. He says even if it hurts, never ever pay the ransom because then hackers know your business is a jackpot. And I promise you they will pay you a visit again sometime in the future. No pain, right? No. I told you, right? You okay? Dr. Balancioni is feeling the pain. He is not paying the $20,000 ransom, but he is paying his accountant to input all over again his financial records. Oh, it's going to cost money, time, five months worth of records. You know, it is what it is, but people need to be aware that you better have some kind of security, some kind of cyber system set up because you don't know if you're the next victim. You have heard this many times, but I'll say it again because it would have made the difference in this situation. Make sure your updates are on, that your firewall is turned on, that your virus protection is up to date, and train all of your employees not to open any attachments, in particular any suspicious attachments, and don't stick anything like a USB drive into a computer. And if you don't know what you're doing, get help from an IT professional quick. In Maitland, Eric Von Eyck and getting results, News 6. Our investigations are broken into two parts, and these kind of mirror how thieves think about your practice. If I want to steal from you, the first question I ask is very simple. Does the practice owner know how much money should be deposited? If the answer to that is no, and that's the case more often than not, then as a thief, I can steal without needing to do anything exotic in your practice management software. I can just put the money in my pocket. So the first thing we do is very simple. We compare practice management software to what happened at your bank. If those two are different, then there's a problem. As a thief, if I think that just diverting some of the deposit will get me caught, now I have to get a little bit more creative. And really what I need to do next is teach your practice management software how to lie. I hate to say it, but it's probably a lot easier than most dentists think. So in our second phase, what we're looking for are deceptive transactions. How do I make the software say that less money came in today than what actually did? At the end of that, if somebody's got their hand in your pocket, they'll know. Based on what we know, if you're graduating from dental school today, there's probably about an 80% chance that sooner or later, somebody's gonna put their hand in your pocket. When people call us with concerns, on average, they're right about 70% of the time. People call us for different reasons, 
Some have already found embezzlement and they're looking for us to help them map it out and get as much money back as they can. Others call us and say, you know what, I don't really think anybody's stealing from me, but the possibility that they might keep me up at night. Then I get the people in the middle who are seeing some evidence of embezzlement and they want to know if it's smoke or fire. If you've been stolen from, we'll be there to walk you through the next steps. And the first thing that most embezzlement victims want to do is get back as much money as they can. And something a lot of dentists don't realize is that you have insurance coverage for employee dishonesty. The amount you have typically is $25,000 and it may be that somebody stole more than that from you, but at least getting that back is impossible. And the report that we give you is going to be suitable to go to the insurance company and, and allow them to process your claim. The second thing that we do is we help you take this person off the street so that they don't victimize one of your peers. And unfortunately, a lot of dentists who have done a kind of self-guided investigation have hit a brick wall when they go into the police department with a shoebox and the police kind of throw up their hands and say, we don't have the expertise or the manpower to be able to take this into a conviction. When we do our work, we wrap it up in a bowl for them. We give them a nice package and our conviction rate is virtually 100%. So people say to me, okay, so you're dentistry's embezzlement experts, what do you do? Well, obviously the first thing we do and the thing that we're probably the best known for is doing investigation. And we do that sometimes when embezzlement has been confirmed and other times if somebody's wondering if it's happening to them. Um, just like dentistry has hygiene, which is the preventative part of dentistry, we have a preventative part as well. It's called office protection system. And the goal of ops is to lower your vulnerability to being stolen from in the future. And nobody thinks that's a bad idea. And we all know how lawyers are everybody's favorite people. So of course we work with lawyers too. We do that when there's a dentist involved and they're being sued or they're suing somebody and they need factual information and we're in the fact business. And like everybody who's passionate about what they do, we love to talk about it. So we have a speakers bureau and that's where you can hear our war stories. Uh, I've said a few times that nothing sounds as good to me as the noise that a cell door makes when it clicks shut on an embezzler. We do these things for general dental practices and we do them for specialists. We do them for solo owned practices and for big DSOs. We truly are dentistry's embezzlement experts. To tonight, hackers target a Houston dental office. All of its system files and data hijacked, it says, by ransomware, which then demanded a payment in exchange for those files. Brandon Walker live now with the warning for anybody who uses a computer. And Brandon, that's pretty much everybody. Yeah, indeed it is, Dominique. And tonight we're here in the Video Distribution Center at KPRC-TV, which also stores servers that houses information for many of our newscasts, in fact. Ransomware looks to gain access to all of that information. Usually you'll receive an email with a link that looks legit, so you click on it. But once you do, all of your information is up for grabs and held ransom, hence the name, for a price. At Poindexter Dental in Sunnyside. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It wasn't tooth, but tech. But it started shutting down. That left Dr. Zeb Poindexter confused and his computers in the dark. Everything just started going haywire down there. It was just one after another, one after another, one after another. That was December 19th. Dr. Poindexter says his office manager couldn't access anything. Patient records, insurance files, the whole nine. I was livid. All files, data were encrypted and locked by what's called ransomware. Ransomware is malicious software that makes it on your computer through any number of ways. Ryan McDonald is assistant chief engineer at KPRC. What the software does is it comes in, it hides in the background, and it encrypts or scrambles um, all the data that's very important to you and it does this quietly and then when it is done um, it puts up a message and says hey by the way we just encrypted all of your data you can't use it until you pay us x amount of dollars luckily for dr poindexter there was backup in the form of backup external servers he keeps updated and that's what saved us with that dr poindexter has a message to share with other small business owners have backups of files because you never know if it can happen to us it can happen to anybody 
Now, because Dr. Poindexter had those backup servers, he did not pay the ransom price, so lucky for him. Experts tell us it is tough to pinpoint who is responsible for ransomware, but Dr. Poindexter says his IT folks noticed that there were quite a few visits from IP addresses in Russia. So what do you do? What can you do to protect yourself? Of course, for one thing, have those backup servers, but the FBI has other information for you because as the FBI puts it, ransomware like this on the rise. More information for you on our website. Click to Houston.com. I'm Brandon Walker. Thank you, Brandon. And Cyber attacks are hitting dentist offices across the country. Hackers are cutting off access to patient information, everything from x-rays to payments. Good evening, I'm Deb Ferris. And I'm Craig DeGrelli. It's called ransomware. Today, our Morgan Mobley spoke with a dentist here in Wichita on how he's protecting patient privacy. Devin Craig, in this particular case, a backup company that provides support for dental offices was compromised. As a result, patient files were locked and dental offices had to pay a ransom to recover that information. I talked to a local dentist who says this is his worst nightmare. These are the kind of things that keep us up at night. Ted Mason has been a dentist for 32 years. Wow, you have really, really healthy teeth. His greatest fear is losing the work he loves. Although his practice has not been hit by the recent round of hackers, he knows what it's like to lose information. Uh, we did lose a hard drive one time and lost three weeks worth of data, and it took us months to put it back together. And so um, we spend a lot of time and money keeping things in place to help us prevent that kind of an attack. Mason remembers the simpler days when everything was pen and paper, and he says these technological advancements come with a price tag. When I started my practice in 1986, we had paper charts and we had regular film-based x-ray and we had paper appointment books. Now everything is on a computer. And so um, the complexity as far as the infrastructure with computers and protecting them and the internet and all that has gotten significantly more complicated. Mason's practice just had their IT support come in to monitor their cybersecurity and found out their firewall is not as strong as it could be. Now we just have to get out the checkbook and start getting some new stuff. <laughs> Shane Yon's president of technology specialists says incidents like this keeps them on their toes too. We have to build bigger mousetraps, you know, just, just as they continue to, you know, do the things they do, then we have to then, you know, investigate and look at better resources and tools. IT's biggest piece of advice is to very intentionally take a look at your cybersecurity effort. Just like you would ensure your building from a fire or a flood, ensure your data from attack. Reporting in studio, Morgan Mobley, Cake News on your side. We are about to begin another episode of the Prosperident webinar series. From their unique perspective as dentistry's embezzlement experts, Prosperident's team brings you information you will not find anywhere else. Now sit back and relax while Prosperident's Amber Weber, Wendy Askins, and David Harris address the issues that are important to you. Hello. Oh, is it done? Oh. <laughs> Hello, dental family. Um, welcome this evening to our Prosperident Power Hour. I'm Wendy Askins, one of your hosts from Texas. We also have Amber Weber, a co-host from Texas, David Harris, Prosperident CEO from Halifax, Canada. And we are so honored to have Gary Solomon here with us this evening from Black Talon Cybersecurity. Um, Cybersecurity is like way over my head, but it's something I'm very interested in and I'm very afraid of it, honestly. And Gary's going to lay it all out for us um, in an easy, simple manner to understand so we can learn how to protect ourselves. We also have Sheila O'Driscoll on our chat with us this evening. So if you want to chat us up, 
um, and make comments that are relevant to um, the subject matter, please feel free to do that. If you want to submit a question, we ask that you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen so that question comes directly to us and we can get Gary to answer that for you. Yeah, we're ready to start. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, an honor to be here. Let's go ahead and get our presentation just, going. Just one sec there, Gary. You're, okay, go ahead. You're one slide ahead of us, buddy. All right. No problem. Go it's, for it. It's good to be enthusiastic, but okay. we're not there yet, man. Timing's well, off. <laughs> we are excited that our audience is joining, joining us again. We're getting ready for our final curtain call. While we've enjoyed spending time with you every month during the Prosperity and Power Hour, uh, we're going to be ending our webinar series next month, and we're going to talk about everything important about embezzlement in one hour. So it's going to be jam-packed full of information. We hope you invite your friends, get your popcorn ready so we can all have fun on that finale. Don't worry, you're already registered. So if you know somebody who isn't, please let them know that this will be our final curtain call next week. Uh, one thing we don't want you to forget. You, you mean next month, right? Sorry, next month. Sorry. You, you, I'm just you gave I'm me so excited there. to see everybody. What I'm can excited. I say? I'm ready. Um, <laughs> the, you, want, you want to know why, you know, we love spending time with you. But one of the main things is we want to start seeing people face to face again. So you're going to be seeing uh, members of our Prosperity team. We're going to be speaking at live events again. So please join us and come meet us in person. We would really welcome that opportunity. Follow our website and see where we're going to be appearing. Maybe it's in a city near you. And if you're attending, as usual, please don't forget, we're going to send you the link for the CE credits. And we want to give a big thank you to Altura Perio for supporting us doing, during our Prosperity Power Hour for the last, what has it been, over a year, year and a half, Dave? This is episode 19, number 20 19. Next, next month. Yeah. So we're glad you're with us. And join us next month for the final curtain call. Yeah, indeed. And uh, I'm off tomorrow to Kentucky to uh, speak to a group of oral surgeons. And uh, I'm really looking forward to having a live audience. As, as much as I like being able to reach you guys through the screen. There's just nothing like seeing you face to face. Um, now, it's a, it's a tremendous pleasure to introduce our guest. And his name is Gary Salman. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Black Talent Security. Um, Gary and I have been friends for probably 10 years. Uh, originally, he was with CareStream, about four, left CareStream and started his own uh, security company. Um, a lot of things I like about Gary, but the, the most relevant one probably for this is that we're a bit alike in the sense that his company and Prosperinet are both hyper-specialized on a really narrow problem. Uh, and it, if you've been a longtime uh, watcher of ours, one of the things you've heard us say is that your accountant is a generalist and probably is, is a little bit out of his or her depth when it comes to embezzlement. And I think the message you're gonna get from Gary about your IT person is very similar. You know, they're great at getting your network set up, but when it comes to protecting you against ransomware, and I, I'm, I'm sure Gary will have a lot more specific things to say, um, but you know, the, the, the IT person who, who looks after your other needs may be out of their depth. Gary and his company exist really for one narrow mission. Um, the other thing I'll mention about Gary is he comes from a dental family. His dad's an oral surgeon, um, you know, grew up around dentistry, like, like all of us at Prosperity and lives and breathes it. So uh, it, is, it is my tremendous pleasure to welcome Gary Salman to our presentation. And with that, Gary, uh, let's see if we can uh, let you take it away. All right. All right. Do you have a screen share icon there for us? Yep. We right. will do it. Do it. Uh, let's see. It's there. We go. All right. Yeah. Screen looks good. Take it. All right. Over. We're good. Yeah. All right. Well, now is my proper start. Sorry for jumping the gun on everyone, but uh, here we go. So, 
Welcome, everyone. Uh, completely honored to be presenting to this extremely large crowd tonight. So uh, thank you, Prosperident, for this opportunity. I'm going to make this real, right? So all the information that I'm going to be presenting to you is our information. This is based on cases we've worked, uh, not things we found on the internet or rumors or things that sound good, right? These are, these are real world uh, situations. So the goal here is I don't want this to be scary, right? A lot of times I'll lecture and doctors will pull me aside and they're like, wow, you really scared me. That's not the goal here. The goal here is to provide you with enough information so as a practice administrator, right, as the owner of the practice, you can make good business decisions because so many of your colleagues that have been victimized by ransomware, they say pretty much the exact same thing to us. If I had only known, I would have done something different. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of the real world problems and our goal here is to help you with solutions, All right? So that's, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about problems and solutions. I'm also going to give you a good idea of what these criminals are actually doing. All right. So I'm going to talk about a couple really interesting cases today. Um, we're going to talk about a takeover of an orthodontic practices cameras and music system. Now, this was not a ransomware attack, but if you talk to the orthodontist that was the victim of this, she feels like she was completely violated because they watched everything she did in her practice and they messed with her. And I'll go through that case. I'm going to talk to you about a ransomware attack against a GP practice, uh, two providers, single location that initiated in the practitioner's home and moved to the practice, and then um, a, a, a couple others. We are currently working a ransomware case right now by a threat group called Conti, C-O-N-T-I. Conti is a very, very active threat group that targets healthcare, right? They, they target other industries as well, but they're going after healthcare hard. This is a GP practice and they got hit a couple of weeks ago and the ransom demand, $550,000. GP practice. Okay, so this is no joke what's going on right now. Now, full disclosure, not every single dental practice that gets hit has a ransom demand that high, but they're averaging around 50 grand for a GP practice and closer to 100,000 for a specialty practice. And that's based on the amount of data. So what's ransomware, right? Ransomware is a form of malicious code that is delivered to your network in typically one of two ways. First is through a phishing expedition or spear phishing where someone in your practice could be a doctor, you know, could be someone sitting at your front desk, opens an email and they think the email is legit. It's coming from my colleague right down the street. It's gotta be legit, says her name. They click on a link, they open an attachment and the ransomware code downloads into the system. And then it starts encrypting or locking all the files. And once it's done, a ransom demand will pop up on the screen telling you, hey, you've been hit by Conti ransomware, right? Or whatever ransomware group. And they'll tell you how to contact them. And then sometimes they'll tell you right on the screen how much they want. Other times you have to go to the dark web to find out how much to pay them, All right? The second way that ransomware ends up on your system, and we see a lot of this, is through a direct hacking event where the hackers find vulnerabilities on the doctor's network through their firewall, through devices. They exploit them using their hacking tools. They get onto the network. They exploit other machines, and then they actually just install the ransomware code, right? Just like your IT person was installing a piece of software for you. And the, the ransomware code will execute in a couple seconds and start encrypting right away. And sometimes in many of these attacks, it'll encrypt every machine on your network and servers in a matter of seconds, right? Depends how much data you have. Sometimes it might take longer. Sometimes it could take a couple hours. But typically, they're going to do this at night. Typically on a Friday, uh, you know, Friday night into Saturday morning, they'll do it before uh, a big holiday. And then you walk in and find skull and crossbones all over uh, your network. All right. So one thing I want you to understand is that a data breach um, is a problem, right? I think that's obvious. But here's an issue that the HIPAA rules clearly state that a ransomware attack is a data breach. So many practitioners have been hit 
buy ransomware and their IT company comes in and just makes it all disappear and restores the data from a backup. But here's the problem. In 75% of the cases, and this is, you can look this up, it's public information, and this is also our statistics, 75% 75 of ransomware attacks result in the theft of your patient data. We see this over and over again. So what happens here is your IT company's like, oh, don't worry about this doctor, I got you covered. They don't realize that all your patient data has been stolen and is gonna be auctioned off on the dark web. That puts you in a very, very bad place from a HIPAA compliance standpoint. So there is something which we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some more, which is called uh, basically triple or even quadruple extortion, which basically means this. When the hackers break into your network, they steal all your patient data, and they will do this without you knowing. Your IT company, in most cases, will have absolutely no idea that it's going on. And there's no alarm bells that can typically go off to tell you that this is occurring. Then they encrypt your data with ransomware. Then if you refuse to contact them, they will then take one to 10% of all your patient data and put it on the dark web. And they'll even send you an email like, hey, you didn't believe me? Ah, hit this URL on the, um, and go to my dark web website and you'll see your patient records, photographs, x-rays, health history forms for sale, right? So... The last thing they're doing, and we saw this for the first time a couple of weeks ago by Conti, they start contacting your data. So if you refuse to pay the ransomware because uh, your IT company just restored from a backup, they will start contacting patients. They will start contacting your employees. We saw this in a GP practice. So let's talk about supply chain attacks. I think most people six months ago, if you said, hey, you know what a supply chain attack is? Most people are like, well, I don't know. I don't know, they disrupt the supply of toilet paper because uh, of COVID, right? That's the first kind of supply chain attack anyone really heard of. However, ransomware and these threat groups, they have in a, an incredible ability to disrupt our supply chains. So I think that one that was the biggest wake up for our country was the Colonial Pipeline. Then we had the meat distribution, which ended up not being as bad as a lot of people predicted. But here's something to think about. Look at these two threat groups, dark side ransomware and our evil. I will tell you for a fact that our evil has hit thousands of dental practices. They also are notorious for attacking IT companies. When we first started working with our evil for obviously the wrong reasons, trying to get people's uh, data recovered, almost every single attack that they executed was against an IT company. And they took the IT company's computers and then attacked all their clients. You heard that if you joined a little early, you heard that news broadcast, right? Where they were talking about an IT company being hit. So you have a Denver, Colorado event. You have the Wisconsin event. You have one down in the Maryland, Virginia area, down in Texas, where they all targeted these dental IT companies and took them out. And typically they hit every single dental practice. Like the one in Denver, they hit over hundred dental practices. And, and thousands of computers and servers were all encrypted with ransomware. These hackers, they don't care if you are a single mom and pop practice with six computers or you know, a Fortune 500 company generating billions of dollars. They take everyone out, all right? So that's what's going on. And they don't care if you're healthcare. There are some threat groups that say they won't target healthcare. I will tell you for a fact, I've seen them hit dental practices. Paul Ferrillo is one of the top attorneys uh, in the country on cyber threats. I did a, a, a whole podcast and uh, video with him uh, the other day, and he talks a lot about what I'm talking about now, not as, uh, as technical, but more from the legal perspective. But this was a post he put up on LinkedIn uh, just recently, and he talks about this. Business leaders have a responsibility to strengthen their cybersecurity defenses to protect the American public and our economy. No company, large or small, is safe from ransomware. This is a huge, huge uh, problem that we see in the dental space. The IT companies, as great as they are, and we work with hundreds of them across the country, they'll tell practices, oh, you're fine. You don't, you, you don't have to worry about this. We have your back. Have you ever had a problem before? Right? And you're like, oh, okay, that sounds good. I'm fine. You can't think that way anymore. So I'll pose a question to you. How confident at this exact moment are you that your antivirus software stops ransomware? 
you have a notepad, start writing this stuff down. How confident are you that your data is backed up properly? This is a huge problem right now, and I'll explain why. And how do you know your system's not currently compromised? We go into some situations where clients sign up for preventative services, we get our tools on there, and right away we know we have a problem. Okay, their system's already been compromised. So here's kind of the little secret that you probably don't know. Most antivirus software is ineffective against ransomware. Okay, here's the second crazy secret. When the hackers get into your system, in almost every case, you know what they do? They shut your antivirus software off. Why? Because they know that's a defensive mechanism that the computer has to potentially try and stop what they're doing. We do forensic investigations. And in a majority of these cases, when we do the investigation, we'll see to the exact fraction of a second the moment that the hackers turned off the antivirus system uh, software on these systems. Another big problem, we get calls all over the country. Hey, we got hit with ransomware. We need your help. But we have a backup. We're like, OK, great. But in the back of our mind, we know one of two, uh, one of three things are going to happen. One, they have a valid backup. Two, they only have a partial backup because someone made a mistake. Or three, which we're seeing a lot of right now, the hackers destroy the backups. I am talking about cloud and local backups. I've had heated discussions with IT companies who are like, that's not even possible. Okay, it absolutely is. There are tools that these hackers can deploy on your networks that steal usernames, passwords, and, and they, they understand how you back up, where you back up. And guess what they want? They want you to pay. So what do you think they're going to do? They're going to sit on your network and destroy all your backups, then hit you with, you, hit you with ransomware. Why? Because it's going to force you to pay. Now, not every case goes that way, right? Full disclosure, but a high percentage of these cases that we're dealing with now, right? In the last couple of months, this wasn't really prevalent last year, the backups are gone. So one of the things that I really want to reiterate here is that this is a team effort. In order to secure your practice, your livelihood, and your patients, it is a combination of your IT company and your practice and a cybersecurity firm working together to secure your environment. And we'll explain why that's the case in a few minutes. But this is, this is how businesses run nowadays. When you look outside the dental space in medical and financials, right, in uh, you know, many small and medium businesses, it's a team effort. So here is literally the biggest problem we see. We talk to practitioners, that haven't been victims. And then obviously we deal with hundreds of ransomware cases. And a majority of these ransomware cases, the doctors say, oh, I really thought my IT company had me. I even had a conversation, right? We've had scenarios where the practitioners have brought in the CEO of their IT company, sat them down and be like, hey, we just got a letter from our malpractice company saying, we got to step up our game, engage with a cybersecurity company. And the owner of the IT company is like, I got you covered. We're good. I'm an engineer. I've been building computers for 20 years. I know this stuff. Oh, doctor, have you ever had a problem before? Oh, no, no, we've been okay. All right, you're fine. And then weeks later, they turn around and they're a victim and they call the guy back and like, how did this happen? You just literally told me this wasn't going to happen. So everyone has what I like to call Mike, their IT guy. And, and like I said, IT companies are fabulous, right? They play a very, very important role with keeping your practice uh, up and running, providing you with equipment. But they are generalists. Just like in healthcare, there are general practitioners and there are specialists. There are cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons. There are general dentists and there are ortho, uh, ortho surgeons, <laughs> orthodontists, oral surgeons, perios, um, pediatrics, right? You get it. And each of those specialties plays a very, very different role. Just because you know computers and build computers and set up networks doesn't mean you're a security expert, right? And typically what we see is the IT companies say, oh no, well, we, we have guys that, and, and women that understand how to do security or covered. And as a doctor, you don't know to ask a question, which is, okay, what are their certifications? Do they have CISSP, right? What do they have HCISPP? What, uh, uh, what do they have? Can you be a dentist without going to dental school? Can you be a physician without going to medical school? No. But any IT company can hang a shingle on their website and say, we do cybersecurity. And you as the practice owner is like, I got that. Okay. 
So here's kind of a typical statement that I see. This was posted on a very popular uh, Facebook website. And it basically is talking about um, a doctor who posted uh, a note saying, hey, I'm, I'm concerned about security. Can you help me out? So one of the CEOs of an IT company wrote, we have plans of all sizes to address the ransomware issue. They line up with the HIPAA requirements you'll want to see. Managed firewall, anti-ransomware software, backup and disaster recovery, and encrypted email. Okay. I don't really know what anti-ransomware software is, and I'm in the security business. All right. That doesn't make really any sense. But in theory, it sounds good, right? Um, not really sure what encrypted email has to do with protecting you from a ransomware attack. I can't see a correlation there. But to the untrained person or the owner or administrator of practice, you're like, oh, that sounds great. I'm good. Sign me up. All right. We'll talk about why that's a failure. So I want you to understand that outages last a long time, okay? On average, in a dental practice, you will literally shutter your doors for 10 days because typically the hackers will take out every single computer on the network. And in many cases, you have to rebuild every workstation. If your IT company just comes in and kind of erases some stuff and puts your computers back online, ultimately, the hackers are probably still in the system and will come back and potentially hit you again. But most practices are down for 10 days. Yes, we have some cases that they're down for two or three days. We have cases where they're down for three weeks because of the complexity and the nature of the attack. This is just a, uh, a rough estimate uh, based on our numbers and our dealings with these ransomware cases. A single provider, single office GP practice is looking at just under $170,000 to deal with a ransomware attack. That's what it costs, right? Now, obviously, if you don't have to pay an extortion fee or if you're able to recover your data, it could be less. But there's a lot involved here. You can't forget about the compliance issues you have both at the state and federal level. These have to be investigated by a forensics firm, right? Just having your IT company say, oh, you'll be fine. I'll restore your data. That's the wrong answer, right? When your data shows up on the dark web and you're like, whoa, if I had known my data was stolen, I would have paid. But it's too late at that point. So what did all these breaches have in common? Well, these are the commonalities between almost every attack we see. They have an IT person, they have antivirus software, they have firewalls and they have backups, but they're still hit. Do you honestly believe that these Fortune 500 companies don't have firewalls? But this is a problem. So many practitioners are like, well, I got a firewall. I spent a lot of money on it. I was told it's going to stop ransomware. It's not. Okay, may it... It may stop certain strains on rare occasions, but it is not effective in terms of stopping ransomware. It looks cool, it blinks, it plays a really important role from a security perspective. I'm not downplaying it, but too many people are relying on antivirus and firewalls. So I wanna take a minute here and I want you to kind of jot down based on this list, what you know or what you think you have in your practice. All right, this is a really important exercise because a lot of people, owners of practices, partners, right, administrators, they're responsible in the end for the confidentiality of the patient records. And you should know what security is in place at your practice. All right, so do you have a firewall? And guess what, guys and, and, and ladies? Just because you have a modem from your internet provider doesn't mean you have a firewall. Some cases, the doctor's like, oh, well, we have a firewall. We get in there, take a look. They're like, no, you don't have a firewall. You have a modem. Some modems have firewall capabilities and some don't. But you need to have a dedicated firewall. Talk to your IT company if you don't. Antivirus software, secure email, cloud backups, local backups, multi-factor authentication, you know, things like that. All right, so here's typically the security layers and who provides what. Your IT company is going to provide your firewall, antivirus, your secure backups, and uh, secure email. There's some possible overlap. There's some new technology out there called uh, uh, endpoint detection and response, which uh, we don't have a lot of time to talk about tonight, so I'm not going to get into it. Uh, they will also potentially provide multi-factor authentication, but these are technologies that a cyber firm can also provide. G through K, that's what cybersecurity companies specialize in. And these are must haves, right? If you want a secure network and you're missing G through K, right? If you don't have all these components, you're eventually gonna get hit. I sit on the panels 
with some of the largest uh, security folks from the largest hospital system, largest security folks, from the security folks from the largest hospital systems across the US that's often um, uh, monitored and, uh, by government agencies. And we discuss this all the time, right? About how important it is to have G through K. And the reality is if you don't have some of these things like penetration testing, which we'll talk about, the hackers will do it for you and you'll be on the wrong end of that equation. So let's talk about some of the facts. After an attack, 100% recovery may not be possible in the short term. What do we mean by that? Think about for a second, all the systems you have. It's no longer just practice management software and digital radiography. Now we're adding in 3D, intraoral scanners, text messaging, appointment reminders, time card systems, voice over IP telephones, cameras, remote access, a lot of these things are kind of band-aided together. And all of a sudden, all the systems have to be rebuilt. Software's got to be reinstalled. And you're like, oh my gosh, we're two weeks into it and we still can't do appointment confirmations, right? We still can't get our electronic claims out. So downtime's really your biggest financial impact. Think about this. If you have to shut your doors for two weeks, because that's what happens. None of your computers work. And in fact, most of the time they're actually damaged, right? Not, not physically, but the operating systems are damaged. They have to be rebuilt. You can't schedule, you can't reschedule. Sometimes the phone systems don't work. What are you gonna do? And then you haven't collected any money for two weeks. You haven't filed claims. You haven't sent bills out. All of a sudden that two weeks becomes four weeks and you haven't collected a penny. So, you know, the hits keep coming. And understand that there is a huge difference between an IT company and a cyber company in terms of what they do and what they provide. That's, that's the mindset that we have to kind of change. So how do we fight back? Well, as crazy and scary as all of this is, you absolutely can fight back. You have to be willing to do something. You have to step up and say, you know what? I don't want to be that doctor that was just on the news. If you saw, if you saw the news story before the webinar started, you got to build strong, resilient systems. Right? The firewall and antivirus model, it's no, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't cut it. Right? You have to be able to understand the threats and address it. Cyber firms do this 24-7. They're constantly working to battle these threat groups. They see the damage and the capabilities of these operations. And understand this, you're up against threat groups from China, from Russia, especially Russia. Some of these threat groups will generate half a billion dollars a year in ransom. You don't think they have some of the best technology out there? Do you really believe that the IT right, your, and your firewall and your antivirus is going to protect you? No. You got, you got to step up the game here. You got to do something uh, above and beyond the, 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 the typical protocols that are out there. All right. So I talked to you about Conti. Conti is an extremely active threat group, right? I, was, I constantly go to these dark web set websites and I found a dental practice. This is real world. And guess what? They didn't put the nice little black rectangles to cover up the name of the practice, right? But you can see, my apologies, you can see here, they released some of the data, their you know, pictures, their bank statements, their HR files, uh, patient records. You know, that's what these threat groups publish. We did a uh, ortho breach out in Utah. The threat group said that they stole all of the doctor's data. The doctor didn't believe it. We asked for proof that the, the criminal stole the data. They sent us a one gigabyte file of all the data they stole. They stole approximately three terabytes. And when we opened up this file or these files in front of the doctor, he was horrified. This is an actual image that the hacker sent back to us from this ortho practice. Got child involved, thousands of them. All right, so David, I think uh, I think you know it'd be a great opportunity for uh, your team and and myself to kind of start talking about you know these real world cases. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through some some post mortems here and and share with you what is actually going on. So if you guys want to pop back on, uh, we can do that. So as they're joining, I'll uh, kind of uh, kick this off. So. One of the problems that we often see is practices don't understand where they're vulnerable. That is also known as their attack surface. 
where can hackers get into the network? It's not always what you think. It's not always right through your firewall or directly to a computer that's potentially exposed or has a vulnerability. It could be from someone's home. It could be from a consultant. It could be from a third party software vendor, imaging IT company, right? So one of the things, David, just like you do, right? With some of the services you offer, right? You have to help your client understand where they have risk, right? So one of the big things here is how many practices have standard operating procedures in terms of how to deal with certain things like backups, passwords, you know, things like that, All right? So a cybersecurity assessment is critical. This is where a cyber firm is gonna come in, ask about a hundred questions, and help you understand where you have risk. How do you back up? Where do you back up? Is your data encrypted? How do you remote into this network? Or are you using multi-factor authentication? Right, about a, a hundred questions similar to those. And then recommendations can be made to harden your network, right? And reduce that attack surface. So, you know, in, in David's world, I'm sure he does things like that to help practitioners mitigate their chances of being a victim of, of financial fraud. So David, anything you want to uh, talk about regarding that? Well, I, I will start by saying, I think this is unquestionably the most frightening presentation I've ever watched. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Gary, I didn't mean to catch you with your mouth full of stuff. No, no problem. <laughs> um, but uh, wow, you know, uh, if, if uh, you are in the audience and this doesn't have your undivided attention, you know, there's, there, 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 there's something wrong with the way you're wired emotionally. This is, this is just beyond frightening. And um, what I'm glad, Gary, is that you have said to people, you know, you don't have to sit there passively and wait for this to roll over you and write your $170,000 in checks to uh, the ransom company and your attorney and all those things. You know, there are things you can do about it. So, um, Gary, you, you've mentioned early on that um, ransomware entities target healthcare companies or companies in the, in the healthcare world. Um, I think I know the answer, but in case I don't, can you tell me why that is? Yeah, because it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the reason is they know the doctors or the healthcare entity, there's a high probability that they're going to pay. Right? Because if they steal their patient data, in most cases, what doctor is going to say, I don't care, publish all the patient data for my practice, all the health history forms, the x-rays, the pre, the post-op images, who cares? Right? I haven't met a doctor that's said that, right? and we do a ton of these cases. So the hackers know the value of this data. If they steal a bunch of spreadsheets from a corporation, maybe some HR files, eh, that's not great. That's a heck of a lot different than stealing people's health history forms, you know, lab reports, things like that. So I will tell you that in a majority of the cases we deal with, the doctor either opts or has no choice but to make the ransomware payment, right? We never, ever want that to happen. But the reality is, David, it's a business decision, right? Yeah. The business decision is can't afford to have you know, if you're a GP, a couple thousand records posted. If you're a specialist, tens of thousands. I mean, we have practices that literally have 750 to million patient records as part of their dental practice because they're a large group. Could you imagine the damage that's done? You probably can't even get enough, you know, well, you could, but the, the, the insurance premiums to protect from something like that is astronomical, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's why they're going after this, these healthcare groups. Now, what the hackers do is they'll go on their, their dark web forums and they'll talk about it. Oh, I just knocked over this dental practice, this dental practice. They just paid me 100000 I got 50000 It took me two hours worth of work. You know, I'm driving a Ferrari now, literally, right? I mean, that's, that's the crazy part. If you look at some of these takedowns of these threat groups, they have $100,000, $200,000 cars sitting outside the front of their houses. That's, that's how much money they're generating. So that's, that's the reason they're targeting healthcare. They, they, they know the risk. They, we literally, in this Conti group that we just uh, uh, are finishing up, they literally told us in a chat session that if you don't pay us, we know the United States laws and you will have the Office for Civil Rights investigating you because we're going to publish your data. 
I mean, they're not stupid people, right? They know how to generate the money. So Gary, I have a question. Um, I've heard some IT people say, do not pay the ransom because you don't get your data back. And if you get it back, the data is scrambled. So it's not readable or usable within your system. Number one, is that true? And then number two, if you do pay the ransom, do you... (laughs) I specialize in embezzlement. I can't believe I'm asking this question. Do you have any um, assurance that they won't keep a copy of that data and publish it at a different time? So all great questions. Um, So our experience has been to date, and I will knock on wood, we've never had a scenario where we couldn't get all the um, doctor's data back. We had one case where some cone beam images were damaged as part of the encryption process during the attack. Uh, but every case we've worked, we've been able to get all the data back. Now, sometimes it's a tremendous amount of work, right? It's not this magic, hey, pay them, you know, and press a button and all the data just reappears. There's sometimes a lot of putting the data back together. But luckily, knock on wood, we haven't had that issue. We've also never had an issue um, where we paid and we didn't get the data back. We've had some, you know, scares where we paid on a Friday and, who knows what they were doing on Saturday and Sunday? They went radio silent. And then Monday at 10 o'clock at night, we would get the keys to unlock the data. That's rough. You know, the doctors would literally wrote a hundred thousand dollars, seventy thousand, fifty thousand dollar check out of their personal accounts. And they're like, where's my money? Where's my return? Right. Where are my keys to unlock this data? It's a rough exercise and extremely, um, extremely stressful. Uh, so was there a third question that I missed? Um, just the second part of that question yeah. is how can you ever be assured that they oh, don't keep a copy of it? They're criminals, uh, right? I, I think you were laughing because you knew the answer. They're <laughs> criminals, right? There's no, there's no guarantees. Um, it is a little weird because they, I will say, a majority of them are what I will say honorable criminals, if that's even real. But conceptually, they know that they have a reputation. They know that everyone talks about this. So if they start ripping people off, they know that there's a less of a likelihood that they will get paid in the future. So typically, if they say they're going to do something, they will do it. And the most ridiculous statement that I could probably make is that most of these threat groups literally have some of the best customer service. If you... If, they, if we buy the keys and something doesn't work, we will message them on the dark web. And sometimes within a couple of minutes, they will pop on and be like, fixed it for you, try this. And we're like, uh, wow, that was impressive, right? They're criminals though. Like I, 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 you know, I don't care about them, right? They're, they're horrible people. But this is the world that they, they operate in, right? It's what I like to say, it's a, a legitimate, legitimate business, right? They are literally running a criminal business and they know that customer service is part of what they have to do in order to be successful. It, it, it makes no logical sense, right? Um, I, wor- I work law enforcement. And, and uh, one of the things that I always say is, imagine me responding to a, a break-in at someone's house. And I pull up and I see a uh, tractor trailer getting filled up with all the belongings of this family. The family walks down to me and they're like, hey, officer, you gotta, you gotta arrest those people. And I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. How much cash do you have? Right? And they're like, what do you mean how much cash do I have? Well, let me go talk to the criminals and see what they want. And then I go talk to the criminals loading up all of their belongings. Like, hey, give us 50 grand. We'll move all their stuff back into their house. I have to go back to the homeowners and be like, you got $50,000 in your safe that you can give these people. They will move everything back in. Literally, that's what's going on right now. Right. And they're, they're very difficult to, to track and very difficult to catch. So that's, that's another issue. Okay. I have a question for you, Gary. Sure. So, you know, they, they hack everything, they get access, they have the control. Where typically, how do you typically pay the ransom? Like, how do you see practice owners settling the score, I guess you could mm-hmm. say, uh, because, you know, they're not going to meet these people in person, you know, right. like think about kidnapping ransom. Okay, let's do cash exchange. Mm-hmm. What's, what's the most common exchange and how, how, do they, how does yeah. that happen? Well, you know, conceptually, to your point, it's almost like that. You take the money, you drop it somewhere, they pick it up, and then they give you something back, which are the, the decryption codes or the keys, really. Um, 
So, wow. Yeah. So one of the ways that um, this works is through cryptocurrency, right? So the process is this. The practice agrees to pay them whatever it is. Let's just say for argument's sake, $75,000. The practice will transfer us through a wire, $75,000. We will convert it to cryptocurrency. It could be Bitcoin, right? There are, there are other different cryptos that the hackers are using, but most of them are using Bitcoin. Um, and then we have to transfer it to the criminals. But here's the catch. That could be illegal. Okay. So I've come across many IT companies and, and, and many doctors who have just made the payment themselves. I'm like, who'd you just send that money to? Are they on a watch list? Are they considered a nation state? Did you literally just pay terrorists? And the, the doctor's like, I have no idea I'm a dentist. I just had to get my data back, right? Or they say, well, my IT guy didn't talk to me about that, right? So there are very, very special background checks that have to be done on these digital wallets, right? These crypto wallets prior to sending the money. All of a sudden you're like, I'm just trying to get my patient data back. And now you're in the middle of a, a federal investigation because you transferred money to Iran, right? Or, or another nation state. So that's why I'm saying you got to understand this is a very specialized science that's going on right now. And the compliance, both at the state and federal levels are huge. And there's a lot to lose here. The problem that we see, Amber, in many of these cases, practices are, are the second they get hit, all they care about is I need to treat patients again. And I'm not downplaying that. That's our number one focus. We know we need to get your practice back up and running, but if it is not done properly, the long-term consequences financially from a compliance standpoint and leave, I'm sorry, uh, financially and then um, from a compliance standpoint are pretty significant, right? So it has to be done properly. So I have another question. How many of the hackers do you see that are not based in the U.S.? I mean, I know right. that's a a hard estimate, but do you see a lot of them are from other countries or right. I mean, wh wh what demographics do you see them typically based out of? Right. So we've never come across a hacking group that is U.S. based. Okay. They're, they're not. Um, the last case that I can think of was uh, I think the Twitter hacks where they locked up the FBI, locked up someone from Florida and from England where they got into some very high profile people's Twitter accounts. That's not really a ransomware case. That's more of a cyber event. Um, I don't know, uh, based on all my intelligence, uh, I don't know of any hacking group that operates inside of the U.S. borders. Uh, but to answer your question directly, it's mostly coming from Russia. Uh, those are just the facts. China as well. Um, what we typically see is Russia is involved heavily in the ransomware business, generating billions of dollars. China seems to be mostly involved in data theft, the theft of intellectual property from businesses and corporations. They, they, they operate, you know, differently, you know, in the end, do they share some information? Maybe. So that's, okay. that's typically, I mean, Iran's there, North Korea, but typically it's coming out of Russia. Okay. Um, I'm really enjoying this discussion. Just a couple of reminders to the audience. First of all, if you have a question, Please use the Q&A, not the chat, to ask a question. Um, the, the, the people who are, who are bringing their questions forward to Gary can't see the, the chat. They can only see the Q&A. And if you, if you have stuck a question in chat, just copy it and paste it back into Q&A, and we'll, we'll make sure that we get it answered. Um, so just, just don't forget that the chat and Q&A are for, there for different purposes. Um, the other thing that I, I want to talk about, and I'd love to hear Gary's feedback on this. Um, traditionally, people have relied on a good backup. In other words, there was a time, I think, evolutionarily, Gary, when what, what ransomware did was encrypt your data. And if you were prepared to walk away from that encrypted data, you really didn't feel a need to pay the ransomware. So if you had a good backup, you just kind of thumbed your nose at these people and said, screw you. I'll just restore from backup. And it right. sounds like the folks doing the ransomware on that basis have kind of elevated their game. And now they're, they're going a step or two further and that a good backup is no longer the, the cure-all for this. Right. Yeah. Look, backups, uh, to your point, backups are critical. I, I tell every client, have a good cloud backup, have a good local backup. 
Now I'm talking about a disconnected backup. And this is a heated discussion I get into with a lot of IT companies because I'll tell our clients, listen, I need you to think old school, right? You remember the days, doctor, where you would unplug a little hard drive or a backup disk or even a tape if you're, you know, been around for a while. You take that tape or backup device, throw it in your backpack or your bag and walk home with it every night. That was your entire livelihood in your, in your bag, right? Then the cloud came and the, everyone's like, oh, who needs local backups anymore? Let's just push all your data to the cloud. And everyone's like, hey, let's go to the cloud. Sounds great. Easy. I don't have to worry about bringing home, you know, this horrible hard drive every day. Then guess what started happening, right? The hackers started gaining access to these cloud technologies. The other problem, David, which we haven't talked about is this. How many practices have actually tried to download their cloud data? Yeah. Have you asked your IT company to download all of your patient records, your practice management software, your attachments, and all of your 2D and 3D images and show you that your system functions? Because a lot of times the IT company is like, oh, well, the 3D images were too big, so we didn't back them up. Well, guess what? All your 3D images are encrypted with ransomware. You're probably going to pay now, right? Here's the next catch to that problem. How long does it take to download your data? If you have 3D imaging, right, cone beam imaging, intraoral 3D imaging through, you know, uh, intraoral scanner that takes STL files, those data sets, David, are huge, huge, huge yeah. terabytes and terabytes of data if you've had them for a couple of years. How long do you think that's going to take to download from the cloud? We, a week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what do you do? Often you can't do anything until all your data comes back. So, you know, that's, that's another challenge. And I get it. There's some technologies that can, can assist with certain things like this, but you got to have this disconnected backup, right? It's called cold storage. So now we're bringing back this concept and that's where I started with, Hey, go out and get a high speed, solid state drive, right? Not the old school spinning ones, you know, that are all chip based, get a couple of those, have your IT company. Um, encrypt them to protect them, right? We've talked about this. The, the theft of those devices is a breach also. Yeah. Um, encrypt them. So only you have the password, meaning the doctor administrator. And then each night, back up all your data, right? Now, some practices may have so much data, they may not be able to back up all the 3D images, but at least do that once a week. So in the worst, worst case scenario, your systems hit, right? Your cloud's data is taken out. You can literally go to your dining room table and take that hard drive off and be like, this is what may save me, right? But the catch still is if they stole your data, what are you going to do? Are you, are you not going to pay or are you going to pay? That's a decision tree that your attorney and your practice is going to have to make, right? Because there's ramifications for, for either decision, um, mm -hmm. legal compliance issues, and then the other side is financial, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, this cold storage is hot. You know, even large Fortune 500 companies, they're going to cold storage, literally a backup that's disconnected from the network. Yeah. So, but where I was going with it, with this was again, I think some people think, and some people have heard from their IT company that you know, as long as you have backup perfection, you're safe against ransomware. You know, if you have a backup that's 100% perfect, you're safe. And right. what what I've seen lately, and you you reinforced it tonight with something you said, is the the companies doing this have up their game. And the way that they do that is they put your information online or they, you know, they convince you that your information is compromised. In other words, having the perfect backup gets your systems functioning again, but it doesn't deal with the fact that some adversarial party has pretty valuable data. And in, in one of our sessions that we did uh, last month, in fact, um, one of the things I was talking about was the value of data. And um, a working credit card number, you know, if somebody has your credit card number, the street value of that's about $5. If they have a, a sort of a patient's healthcare record with insurance information, date of birth, social security number, that kind of stuff, the value of that record is about $50. Exactly. Yep. That's the number we see. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, this is, this is evolved past we're just going to lock up your data and, and you're going to pay us so that you can access it again to we're going to take your data. And if you don't want to pay us, we're going to do something with it that's going to hurt you. Yeah. And, and that's the challenge. Like, 
no matter what, your primary focus should be, I never want a yeah. threat actor to get into my system. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, that's rule number one. You need to up your defenses. Um, let, me, let me give you a, a couple examples, some real world, real world stories here. So everyone can really understand what's going on here. Uh, we recently finished up a case about three months ago. This was a pediatric and ortho practice, two locations in Southern California. Um, the practice called us. They had heard about us. They said, hey, both our locations are fully encrypted with ransomware. They hit our servers. Every workstation has a skull and crossbones on it. So we get in there. We immediately recognize the threat group. Um, we explained to the doctor right away that there's a very, very high likelihood that all of his data has been stolen for both locations. Um, and he's like, yeah, I don't really think that happens. Uh, and we said, all right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go down that road when the time is right. Um, when my security guys got in there, we immediately called a timeout because guess what we found? On almost every single computer, they had installed three different types of screen sharing applications. You know, like those go to my PC, log me in, splash top. Now, I will say that's the first time we've seen them install three different types. But when we started really critically thinking about it, our security team were like, this is almost genius because an untrained person, regular IT company would be like, oh, wait, this isn't our screen sharing application delete. And they may have, they may miss the second, right? The secondary or tertiary screen sharing application. What's wrong with screen sharing applications? Well, there's a lot wrong. First, the firewalls and antivirus software, they don't typically block them. Why? They're legit programs, right? They're, they're, the, the, your, your computer looks at it as legitimate. It's just been installed by a criminal. The second thing is it goes right through your firewall, right? It opens up a port. It allows in tra traffic to come in, traffic to go out. So you know what the hackers do? They sit there from their desktop. They click an icon. They just logged into Dr. Mary Smith's computer, right? Her laptop. In this case, they had access to every single computer. We're talking about about 40 computers. Um, and when I explained this to the doctor, he's like, well, what about my laptop? I said, yeah, we found it on yours also. So he said they were watching me read my emails and every website I went to. I said, unfortunately, yes. You know, and, and that's when the panic started to set in, you know, because he knows he's like, I, I, you know, send emails with my referrals. So let me ask you this. Does it does encrypted email protect you from that type of environment? No, I mean, from that type of attack, I should say no, because the data is on your screen decrypted. So they're just watching your screen. They sit back and watch. Guess what else do they do? They figure out. Yeah. Online banking and online banking. So that was a huge problem. One of the files that these criminals took was an HR file with every one of their employees, name, date of birth, social security number, home address. So now the doctor had to go out and get identity theft, you know, which is not super expensive. I get that. And you're talking 25, 30 employees, but the up. stress, right. For those employees, he said it was off the wall. They were, they were upset for days, you know, cause they felt like they were violated. And, and, and they're mad at the doctor because they really thought that, you know, he or she had the duty to protect this information and they didn't. Yeah, they, they feel, you know, almost let down, betrayed, you know, and, and it's tough. This is a very, very emotional thing. Why? It's a personal attack. You feel victimized. You feel like you can't control it. And, and I come, as you said, from a family of doctors, I'm type A, like, we want to control everything, right? And, and you're that way too, David, I know for a fact, right? You want to control everything. And now you're like, someone has just controlled every aspect of my life. And, it, and, it, and it's horrible. I mean, this, this dental practice we just finished up in, in Connecticut, they broke into her home machine. They encrypted her home computer with all of her photographs from her children. She had to pay about $7,000 to get all of her photographs, you know, from when her children for, were born to about age eight because she didn't have a backup. Okay, right? Not pointing fingers, but she's like, I can't lose those pictures. That's, they're gone forever, right? And they used her computer to attack her office. So not only did she get hit personally, she got hit professionally, but now she had to answer to her partner, like, I'm going to have to own up to this and admit that this was my mistake, right? Um, they were down for two weeks, David. They couldn't treat patients. They went out and they bought laptops. They started with a blank database. They hooked up a periapical sensor. But then the patient's like, you just took an x-ray on me two weeks ago. Eh, you can't take another x-ray on me. Where's my previous x-ray? you know the path that you know, people will go down in these types of events. She literally called me on a Sunday night and says, I think you know, early 40s, she said, 
I think I have to go to the emergency room. I feel like I'm having a heart attack over this, you know, and, and my heart bled. I'm like, I'll stay on the phone with you. I'll talk you through the whole thing. You know, it's, it's not going to be as bad as you think we'll get you through this, you know, but this is, this is how close, you know, and emotional these types of things, you know, get to, to business owners. So yeah. Harry, we have, we have a ton of questions right. under Q and a, do you want to start knocking those out and answering some questions for our Absolutely. Viewers? Just, just before we do, Wendy, for, for one second, I just want to draw a couple of parallels here between um, what, what happens to people in, in cyber attack and what happens to people when they get the financial equivalent, which is embezzlement. And, you know, that feeling of violation that Gary mentioned, uh, Wendy and Amber know this really well. That's, you know, that's something that people feel from embezzlement and they, you know, they equally feel it from from cyber attack. And the other thing is, and, and, and Gary, I think you framed this nicely. You know, when you're at the point where you see the skull and crossbones on your computer, what you have to do then is make the best of a series of bad choices. Yeah, uh, and by far and away, everybody's best place they can be is to organize their lives and their businesses so that they never get to that point. You know, and it's just like we say, about embezzlement, you know, if you can set up your systems properly, and Amber uh, works extensively with clients in, in that area, so that you don't get stolen from, that's a lot less painful than than dealing with it after the fact. So, you know, I, I when I introduced Gary at the beginning, I said we have a lot in common, and and as this conversation goes on, I'm seeing even more of it. Sorry, Wendy, um, let's let's get to those questions, but I just wanted to make those observations before we did. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I love that you made that, those parallels. Um, here's, here's a good one. What is the number one task a practice owner should look at when back in the office tomorrow? It's like number one, top on your list, what should they do? Um, I think they have to evaluate their tax surface, right? Because it's hard to say what the, the number one Risk for practice A could be very different for practice B, but we can break it down to a couple things. One of the ways practices get hit is through phishing emails, right? As I described, employees receive an email. It looks like the orthodontist down the street, looks like an x-ray, they click on it, or it looks like it's from Amazon, they click, and next thing they know, skull and crossbones. So you can beat phishing emails by training your staff. Right, so cybersecurity awareness training is critical. It is required under federal law if you're a healthcare provider. Every doctor probably knows they have to train on OSHA, right? Can't have an assistant get stuck with a needle and be like, oh, OSHA, what? I don't, I don't even heard, I've never heard of OSHA. That doesn't fly, right, from a compliance standpoint. But a majority of practices, I'll probably say 80% of practices have no idea that they're required to train. So if you want to help reduce your risk, search out training platforms, right? Cyber firms offer it, you know, where, where they can, you know, uh, access learning management systems to learn how they can identify these types of threats. What, what I hear doctors often say is, you know what, I'm going to go back and just tell my staff not to click on anything. Yeah. That that's, <laughs> forget it. I mean, that's useless. First, just shut your practice down because you won't get x-rays, can't take your referrals, you can't send stuff back to your specialists. Like that, that doesn't work, but you got to educate, you got to empower your team. Right. So that, that's, that's something that they can really do. The second thing is talk to your IT company, right? Understand, hey, what are you guys doing for me? And you remember that long list that I showed you before? I would be willing to bet I nailed it, right? The very first four items is what a majority of practices are being provided with. And it's not enough. It doesn't work anymore. You know, uh, you got to think this isn't right. This isn't 2016 anymore, right? This is 2021. Uh, th those are important aspects of security, but that's not the end all to be all. So, you know, have an understanding of what security is in place, then search out specialists to harden your security. Okay. Right. Someone also asked, how can I protect from incoming attacks or is there any preventative measures I can e execute or use? You just answered that, correct? The, the so, train your staff with the email. So, so there's two, so I think there's two parts to this, right? There's the email based attacks but there's the direct hacking events where hackers will scan the firewall. They'll look for vulnerabilities on computers and devices, right? That requires a whole different set of uh, software and skills to look for those vulnerabilities. That's typically what's provided by a cyber firm, right? They will launch 
cyber attacks against the firewalls. They will have ethical hackers attack the firewalls, uh, software attack the computers on the inside of the network, looking for these vulnerabilities that hackers will exploit. I think the best analogy, Wendy, probably the easiest way to explain this, and, and David, you know, and, and you did it on a, the previous presentation, is kind of the analysis of your own home, right? You're like, you can say to yourself, oh, my home's like Fort Knox, right? I got the best deadbolt on here. My windows are secure. And then an expert comes by and like, oh, you think that window's secure? Watch this, right? They come with a little bar, pop, the window's open. And 10 seconds later, they're in the first floor of your house. You're like, well, how did that happen? I just you know, upgraded my, my security. Um, so conceptually, that's what cyber firms do. They look for these holes in the networks that hackers exploit, and then they work with the IT company to patch those holes, right? We're not talking about just patching software. It's a much more complex task than that, but you have to look at all the devices on your network, right? Use sophisticated software and human intellect to determine where they're vulnerable and then harden those devices. That's how you protect from these inbound attacks. So training, vulnerability management, penetration testing by, by you know, certified ethical hackers, that's how you do this. So um, I know you had mentioned that they can access the system from other vulnerable devices that aren't directly, you know, software related. Can right. you give some examples of that? Would that be, you know, like, I know you talked about the video cameras, but what are, mm. what are some other advices? Um, yeah. One person wants to know, like guests, uh, patients can get on like guest Wi-Fi. Is that right. a vulnerability? Okay. So good question. So let's, let's talk about that. Cause I think that's a really, really good question. It's something that practices can kind of do on their own or their help with their IT company. If you have a wireless network within your practice, right? Understand that that wireless network is an extension of your wired network, okay? So if a patient comes in and pops open a laptop, for instance, and connects to your business Wi-Fi, they are literally connected to the same network that all your office computers are running on. Now, if they set up guest Wi-Fi and create what's called network segmentation, where the practice runs on this part of the network and the patients run on this part of the network and there's no way for the traffic to cross, that's relatively good security for Wi-Fi because you don't ever want them to have access to any devices. Keep in mind, if you have Wi-Fi, most Wi-Fi devices nowadays can be cracked. That's the reality of it, unless it's running the brand new protocol. Literally, a person can sit in a car or in an office next to you, pick up your Wi-Fi signal, and potentially gain access to your network. Now, they have to have some skills, right? This isn't typically, you know, average Joe doing this to be fully transparent. You got to have this also you, also, you also have to have this network segmentation. So have a separate guest Wi-Fi that has no ability to um, transact to the uh, business network, right? Send information back and forth. So you talk to your IT company and say, hey, I want you to segment my guest Wi-Fi from my business Wi-Fi. And they should know how to do that. Many firewalls will allow you to do that. Okay, someone asked, actually twice. Okay. So this is very important to someone. Um, what do you think of whitelisting software that stops executable code from ever running without your permission? I think that's going to be a pretty technical answer. Um, <laughs> so uh, fasten your seatbelts, ladies. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I want to dig deep into that, to be honest, on this call. But look, whitelisting, I'll, I'll talk generally because I think this, this will help. Whitelisting is a powerful technique. So let me give you an example of whitelisting. Your firewall, right? If you have someone connecting from the outside world, let's say you have a practice manager at home right? And he or she wants to connect to the office or a doctor. What you can do is you can take the IP address of that doctor's home or that practice administrator's home, right? Their, their modem. You can load it in the firewall and you can whitelist it, right? So only people coming from those IP addresses can technically get into the firewall. That's a, an effective tool, right? You can also then uh, specify, you know, certain software applications that can only run on the network, so there are some capabilities, but I, I, what, I, what I struggle with with a lot of businesses and practices is they hang their hat on one thing. Like my IT company is just going to whitelist these, these software applications and anything else 
eh, it's not going to run. What happens if the hackers get in and gain administrative access to that machine and shut that off? You're done. It's no different than a burglar coming in and potentially clipping the phone line, shutting your power off on your house, and they kick the front door and there's no cameras, there's no alarm. All right. So we have to think layered security, right? And this is everything David kind of talks about, you know, both from an embezzlement perspective, right? And, you know, your last presentation talked about from a physical perspective, you got to think multi-layers. If you're going to rely on one or two layers to, for security, you're ultimately going to fail. It's no different than you going out and having your IT company sell you the best piece of anti-ransomware technology, throwing it on your network and be like, hands are clean. I'm, I've, I've washed my hands of this whole problem. I'm good to go. And finding out it wasn't quite as good as you thought it was. Right. So yes, look, whitelisting is an effective methodology, but it is not the end all to be all. It is part of a security defense. So very good question. So someone, someone whoever asked that is pretty technical. <laughs> they know what they're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Um, what would what would you estimate a cybersecurity budget to be for cybersecurity insurance, IT, cold backups, and associated maintenance updates, et cetera, for best practices for a single location practice? Uh, so it's that's a really hard an question to answer because. There are so many variables there. How many computers, how much data, um, things like that. So from, I can give you some rough ideas. Uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, you know, if you budgeted six, $7,000 a year um, on the high end, I'm talking like an average practice for say 12 to 14 computers, average GP practice, right? That, that number would provide you with very significant security, okay? Um, you know, Vulnerability management, pen testing, training, assessments, things like that. Pretty much the core of what you need. Uh, backups, look, they can be all over the map. There are backup solutions that you can buy yourself for 40 bucks a month, which I don't really recommend. I really recommend you talk to your IT vendor and get a good quality backup solution from them. It depends on the amount of data. Do you have a cone B machine? Do you have an STL, you know, intro uh, camera that generates STL files? Right, those file sets become huge, and many of these backup solutions you pay per you know gigabyte or terabyte of data. Um, those backups can run you know from your IT vendor fifty to hundreds or, or or more per month, depending on how much data you have. Uh, patch management, patch management is important. That's where your IT company you know tries to keep your computers up to date. That should be part of your plan from your IT company, right? That's not an option. You have to make sure that your computers are getting patched. Um, that's typically part of some type of level of service that your IT company is going to offer. I would say at an absolute minimum, you want to have a level of service from your IT company that offers patch management. So, but, you know, look, that could be a couple hundred bucks a month and up, depending on how many computers you have. So, you know, all in, maybe just rough math, $10,000, $12,000 a year for, for that. Depending, obviously, it's variable based on some of the things that I've said. So, okay, and this is kind of a this a kind of a tricky question. How can I secure the devices that my staff carry from external attacks that potentially could have access to my network? Ah, great question. So, remember the first question I answered about guest Wi-Fi. That's how you do it. Your staff, and really even the doctors, they, their phones, their mobile devices, their tablets, their laptops, their watches smart devices in your practice, like a smart TV, a thermostat, anything that is internet accessible should connect to the guest Wi-Fi on a segmented, or it's also called VLAN. Um, they should connect to that. They should not connect to the business network. So that's how you beat that. Uh, can hackers access your data through a copy machine, fax machine, thermostat, or other devices like that that have IP addresses in your office? Can they get that through that? So way? great question. So we're really talking about IOT, which is a phrase that's been around for a while, uh, a while now, Internet of Things. We're talking just like you said, a smart television and IP based uh, multifunctional printer, copier, scanner, um, you name it. Uh, cameras, voice over IP telephone systems. Okay. So what I'll say is that Many of these devices are internet facing, meaning you can gain access directly from the outside world. 
And what happens is without segmentation, right, this, this network segmentation we've been talking a lot about, they can potentially gain access to a device and use that device as a launching pad against other devices on the network. Probably one of well, the two most famous uh, hacking stories are in Vegas, four or five years ago, you can Google this, you'll find it, where hackers gained access uh, to a thermostat in a fish tank at a casino and used that uh, operating system that controlled that thermostat to attack the network, right? Public information, right? So perfect example. The other one is the Target, right? The Target department stores. You know how they hacked that system? They accessed the HVAC, the heating and ventilation control system. And who the heck would think that that's going to be a methodology to attack servers storing billions of dollars of, of information and data? But so these devices are, are vulnerable. The best way to do it, once again, is really to, to, to do this segmentation. Keep these devices off. Keep them patched. When you see on your television, your smart TV, hey, we have a new piece of software. Would you like to run the update? The answer is absolutely, right? Many companies come out with patches for their devices, not only to add new functionality and features, but to patch, to sec to patch security vulnerabilities, right? So that's why going back to the previous question, that's why it's important to engage with your IT company on a patch management uh, process. It is not, once again, the end all to be all. Just patching your computers will not secure you but it helps as uh, a security uh, strategy. It's part of your security strategy. Okay. Here's another one. We've been using Threat Locker for the past few months with our clients, which are dentists, and haven't had any malware attacks. Any opinions on that system used with software like Intercept X and a Sophos firewall? Right. So I won't just out of respect for the companies, I don't typically talk about specific products, but I'll speak in, in general terms. Um, some of these technologies that were just referenced are designed to potentially intercept ransomware, stop ransomware, detect ransomware if it's executed. They're used as, once again, you know, a multi-layered defense uh, to uh, you know, harden the, the network. Like, these are good technologies, all right? But once again, the most important part is this multi-layered approach, which is don't let anyone get in the network to begin with, right? Through this vulnerability management, pen testing, training. But if they do, let's hope you have additional layers of security to potentially block this, right? So some of these technologies that are out there are called uh, uh, EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response, which is starting to become a little old school. The next generation is called XDR, Extended Detection and Response. This type of technology uses artificial intelligence to detect hackers on your network, right? To potentially stop ransomware. But even this mo the most advanced artificial intelligence software, it will not stop everything, right? So that's the failure point, right? Because what happens is we forget about all the other security measures in place. We let the criminals come into our house and we hope our dog's gonna wake up and bite them and chase them out of the house. But criminals are smart. They will buy the same software that the IT companies were throwing on these networks and try and defeat them, right? But look, we, we are proponents of this software. We do believe that EDR, XDR software is an important part of a security uh, posture, as well as you know, some of these next generation firewalls and some of the technologies that they provide. But you gotta, you gotta think critically about this stuff. You think these you know, multi-billion dollar companies don't have this stuff on their networks too? They do, right? So everything can be defeated. Right. It's just, you know, what does your attack surface look like? How are you minimizing that attack surface to keep them out? And look, hackers are typically opportunists. If they feel like they're going to have to spend too much time to getting at your patient data, they will move on to the next system. Right. And that's a fact. So, you know, try keep, you know, point number one, and I keep saying the same thing over because a lot of people miss this is do things to prevent them from getting into your network to begin with. All right. And then layer on these additional uh, security measures. So that's, that's how I'll, I'll, I'll generalize that statement without, you know, giving my personal opinion on a professional opinion on specific products. All right. Well, Gary, thank you. We're, we're at uh, time here and questions are still coming in and I'm sorry that we didn't get to them all. Uh, what I'll invite you to do though, with, with your questions is reach out to Gary and contact information is there on the screen. So if we, if we didn't answer your question and I, I, I do see that we have a little bit of a, a, a backlog of questions. Um, Gary, I'm sure would be happy to 
answer okay. them for you and have a conversation about how you can um, uh, not be a victim of this. Um, Gary, I want to thank you very much. This was uh, just just terrific information. Um, you know, it's a subject I've always had some interest in, and I I still learned a heck of a lot tonight. So, um, very tremendous presentation and and everything that uh, that I thought it would be. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my my three co-hosts, uh, Wendy and Amber, on camera, and uh, we've we've been together on these for all. A whole lot of time, and uh, I, I, I can't, uh, I can't ever say uh, too much about how how terrific they are to work with. And also our our, our third camera shy team member, whose name is Sheila O'Driscoll, and Sheila runs the runs the chat for us. Um, we should bring her on next month. I think. <laughs> That's yeah. two. That's yeah, two. we should. We should. Okay, we voted, <laughs> and it's going to happen. Um, and speaking of next month, September twenty third is our final session in this series. So this this will be webinar number 20 for us uh and uh oh my gosh there's there's she sheila, is. Hi. Hi, sheila. Uh, it, it, it will be our, our wrap-up webinar we're going to have lots of neat things we'll have some giveaways we'll likely have some prosperity team members join us so i'd like to thank everybody for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in just over a month thanks everybody and uh, we'll talk to you soon bye all right thanks gary you're, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Bye.